Please stand for the call to worship. Hear then the call from your king. Give thanks to Yahweh, for he is good. His covenant faithfulness is everlasting. And let all who fear the Lord say, his covenant faithfulness is everlasting. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. O Lord, we pray, save us. O Lord, we pray, send prosperity. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord from this time forth and forever. Together, let us call upon God. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of the holy prophets from of old. Hear your king's greeting. To those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling, with all who in every place call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and Christ Jesus our Lord in the power and fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Amen. It is good for us to know whom we worship, and that is the God revealed in the scriptures. And the church fathers have summarized for us our Trinitarian faith. So let us together profess the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of the same essence as the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. He became incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made man. He was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again, according to the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will never end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. He proceeds from the Father and the Son, and with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified. He spoke through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We affirm one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look forward to the resurrection from the dead and to life in the world to come. Amen. And so we rejoice that to a sinful people has been sent a Redeemer, and the Redeemer is none other than the eternal God. So we will sing now this morning, O come all ye faithful.
Please be seated. It is marvelous to consider that the eternal word of God was made flesh in order that sinners would be delivered from the guilt and the penalty of our sins. So let us understand why Jesus had to be made flesh, why the eternal God had to come and be born of the virgin. Let us remind each other of the purpose of God's law. God's law displays his holiness and perfection. It is given as my only sure guide to knowing his will and pleasing him. But as a fallen man, I cannot obey the law. I turn to the law to see my sinfulness, that I may be humbled and confess my sins before God, because he declares, as I live, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked man turn from his way and live. I will not be justified by the works of the law. The Lord Jesus tells us to consider his law this way. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you. And from the one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And if you wish that others would, what you wish others would do to you, do so to them. Now, if you love only those who love you, what benefit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? Even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But for you, love your enemies, do good, lend expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. Judge not, you will not be judged. Condemn not, you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. What is very difficult here is that this goes so against our common understanding of life that we tend to ignore what is being said here. But Jesus is not speaking idle words because he is explaining the mind of God and why he is on earth. The ungrateful, the evil that he is speaking of is you and me. And we despise God. We didn't care for his creation. We certainly didn't care for his law. And what was God's response? He didn't react to us in the same way, but instead he came down, took our flesh, fulfilled the law, which we would not, and then died the sinner's death so that we would not. And now he extends the gospel and he says, if indeed my spirit is in you, this is the character that's being formed in you. That you would be a people who would not look and say, according to the ways of the world, you're nice to me, I'll be nice to you. You ignore me, I'll ignore you. You hate me, I'm gonna take revenge. He says, no, I'm giving you this mind. You will look at each and every person and see in them the image of God. And knowing that they are of the fallen race, you will recognize there will be rather loathsome people. Many will be your enemy and they will even abuse you. You will see in them fallen men and women whom you will pity because they are blind. And you will be gracious and merciful to them, praying for them, even after they have hurt you even while they are hurting you, because that will demonstrate to you and give you confidence, my spirit is in you. And without that, don't expect much, because if you are the kind of person who holds a grudge, if you are the kind of person who condemns others because you find their faults, then Jesus says, then expect by that same rigor, you will be condemned. But if you are a person who knows others have sinned against you, and yet you are charitable and gracious, a greater measure will be poured out. The imagery there in verses 38 and 39, it's kind of like if you're giving someone a flower. Remember back then you used to grind your own flower at home. 
he says it will be like packed up and then measured and overflowing. So you ask for one cup, well, he's going to cram it into the cup, add it overflowing so that it looks more like a cone, and then dump it into your lap that you're going to carry it home in. He's going to give you an overflowing amount, but you need to become a generous and charitable person. So this commandment or commandments, they're overwhelming because it's kind of easy to think about don't do this, don't do that, but love your enemies. We don't have it in us. So as we go before God and confess now, we're going to have to say, God, we need your spirit to continue to transform us in order that Christ's spirit would help us to understand how to think because this is how you think and how to love that we cannot do of our own strength. Let us confess that we are sinners, but also that we are the chosen ones of God. God has sent his son Jesus in the likeness of my sinful flesh as an offering for my sin. In doing this, God demonstrates his electing love for me in that Christ died for me, the sinner, that no one is justified by the law before God is clear. For the man who by faith is righteous shall live. I don't have a righteousness that is my own from my obedience to the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. Righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. I believe that I am justified by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, apart from my own works and attempts to follow the law. And if it is by faith, let us know what is this faith? What is a true and saving faith? True faith is not only a sure knowledge by which I hold as true all that God has revealed to us in his word. It is also a wholehearted trust which the Holy Spirit works in me by the gospel that God has freely granted, not only to others, but to me also, forgiveness of sins, eternal righteousness and salvation. These gifts are purely of grace, only because of Christ's merits. Knowing then that we, the enemies, have been loved and forgiven by a gracious God, let us confess not only what we know God knows about us, our sins, but let us also pray for the power of his spirit to sanctify us that we should reflect his character in all of our interactions with men. We come before you, our God, a day in which many in the world commemorate the incarnation but fail to understand why you would take on flesh. So now we ask that you would help us to understand that Jesus had to come and be that little baby because he had to grow up to be the sacrifice for our sins to die in our place because we hated you, we violated your law, and we would be condemned, and yet you chose to adopt us. You chose to love us. And so now we live because Christ was gracious and loving and fulfilled the requirements of the law and died the sinner's death. And now you call us to confess this and to rest in Jesus Christ, to embrace and to believe all the promises made in the gospel and to trust that you will never fail to keep your word. And Lord, we find this difficult to believe because we are a loathsome people and we do know how to keep grudges and we hate and we never fully forgive others. We always remember what they've done wrong. And so it's difficult for us to believe that you would be gracious and you would blot out the record of our sins. So forgive us, Lord, for not believing your own revelation and not trusting in you, not believing you are loving. We ask now, O Lord, that you would work in our hearts to give to us a firm conviction of how holy you are and how gracious and merciful you are. How wicked we have been, and yet that we have been adopted by grace and that there is no record of our sins before you. Help us, therefore, to live as a people who have treasures in heaven above and who are to be light to the nations. May we delight, may we find great pleasure in the opportunity of declaring the excellencies of your grace in all the world. So we pray, O oh Lord, give to us a firm conviction of the forgiveness of sins which is ours through the work of Jesus Christ, that we may be thankful, relieved and comforted, and that we would be of all people 
the most joy-filled worshipers who glorify your name. Amen. Beloved, it would be good to be reminded of the gospel, so please stand to hear the declaration of pardon. Summarizing scripture, beloved, to you who by faith have confessed and repented of your sins and trusted in Jesus' merit alone, I declare in the name of Christ and by the authority of his word, your sins are forgiven and the record of your transgressions is blotted away and your everlasting salvation is hid now in Christ Jesus who will resurrect you in the last day. Beloved, it is good for us to know that God does want us to find joy in the gospel and to respond. And so we are going to sing now Isaiah chapter 40 verses 1 through 5. And what is so remarkable, remember, God tells us, your sins are red as scarlet. They are before me, but come, let us make them whiter than snow. So here you have the word of comfort being announced, Isaiah announcing to the prophet, and this fulfilled as John the baptizer comes and declares the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Comfort, comfort ye, my people. Comfort, comfort ye, my people, speak ye peace, thus saith our God. Comfort those who sit in darkness, mourning neath their sorrows low. Speak ye to Jerusalem of the peace that waits for them. Tell her that her sins I cover, and her warfare now is over. Yea, her sins our God will pardon, blotting out each dark misdeed. All that well deserved his anger, he no more will see or heed. She has suffered many God will change your pining sadness into ever-springing gladness. For the herald's voice is crying in the desert far and near, bidding all men to repentance since the kingdom now is Please be seated. While the herald went forth, the Lord Jesus Christ came, and now the word and the work has been given to us. And so as we come before God and we pray, this is not just part of the liturgy that we do, it is part of our active worship before God, and God knowing that our minds wander and that we're not naturally trained up in prayer, that's why he's given to us the Lord's Prayer. That is why we are given these uh, lists of things to do. It's to help us focus and meditate on the mission given to us to pray for ourselves, our church, and the nations. As you see there on page 16, the needs of our own congregation, the nation that needs to be prayed for, and the many peoples around the world. Let's pray. Great God and King of glory, we rejoice that you will to declare and to bring to conclusion the redemption necessary, that you would purchase for yourself a people and you would make for yourself a kingdom 
that would be a royal priesthood and a holy nation of the redeemed, and that it was the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that redeemed us, that washed us, and now has blotted away the record of our sins, and instead has credited to us all the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So that as we come before you in prayer, you hear our prayer because it is mediated by Jesus. And you see not us in our sins, but you see us clothed with his righteousness, making us fit to be in the throne room of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. How marvelous to know that you hear our voice this day and that our worship is united with the worship of the saints who are above. So we know that we are naturally unworthy, so we are thankful for the grace that makes us to be your own precious possession and your family, your children whom you have adopted. May we therefore be thankful. And as we leave this place, may we remember what a great treasure we have. Born of the flesh, sinners, yet we have everlasting life. We have not fulfilled the law, and yet instead you will give to us an everlasting inheritance, and you will be our Father forevermore. May we therefore be thankful and recognize that we are given the opportunity of serving you so that indeed we can look upon the worst of our enemies and still love them. We can even look upon those who hate us and would abuse us and that we are able to forgive them and leave it in your hands and even pray that you would be gracious and merciful to them. We ask all this in order that your character would form in us and the world would see your spirit working in us, conforming us to your glorious image. Now we ask for our own congregation. Bind us in love. Grow us nearer to one another. May we know the needs of each other and come alongside those who are grieving, those who need encouragement, and be there alongside them. And also, when there are others who rejoice, with the many wonderful gifts you have given that we celebrate with them and we rejoice at your bounty. In all things, O oh God, may we recognize what a privilege we have to love those whom you have loved, your children. Let us therefore learn to come closer to one another and care for one another, uphold one another, and walk in love. We also pray for our own church's work. We pray that we would always have the pure gospel preached and believe it and understand it, that your people would wrestle with the doctrines that are listed and not only seek to find those things that are comforting, but also those things that challenge us to grow, to help us to recognize what is sin, what is righteousness, and that we may serve one another even better, and that next year we'd be able to look back and see what progress your spirit has made in transforming us in your glorious image. We pray for the works that we support. We thank you for the privilege of being there to partner with the work in Ventura and in Armenia. And we ask, O oh Lord, that you would cause the worship of your name in these places to send forth the light of the gospel. We pray especially for Armenia. We know they have many challenges, but Lord, you have given to them a stubborn spirit that they would persevere and would not bow a knee to Islam or to atheist communism. Now, may they not just be stubborn, but actually be believers, rege regenerate a people there and cause them to be missionaries to the nations around and a blessing to that whole area. We pray this day for Vietnam. And we know that there has been much trouble in that land, but you've also preserved for yourself a people. So may the church bring forth the word of the gospel and reconcile man to man, and especially God to man, through the gospel of Jesus Christ. We pray for the Virgin Islands and Wallace and Fortuna, and we ask that you should cause the peoples there to remember that they bear your image, they are called to account, and they have the privilege of service. And because they are isolated, their service will often be in prayer. May they pray always for the mission of the church and with zeal and vigor. We pray for Yemen, and Lord, it grieves us to know not only the material suffering there through years of war, but also it grieves us even more knowing that once there were many churches there that have now been turned to mosques or destroyed, we pray that you should again call believers to proclaim the gospel and you would bring peace to that land and that the peoples of Yemen would turn to you and live. We pray for Zambia, thankful that the gospel is being proclaimed, and we pray that the church would prevent the Islam from entering that land by preaching the gospel and that you would be gracious and save many and do not allow the darkness of Islam to descend on that land. And lastly, we pray for Zimbabwe 
And Lord, we know that the church was corrupted there and that many have ceased to believe. We know that there are faithful believers, so we pray for the elect remnant to persevere in truth and for the gospel to go forth, that the hope of life would go to a people who are now in darkness. We pray for our own nation, knowing that we have among us all sorts of corruption. We are a nation filled with every sort of immorality. Lord, help us to realize as a Christian church, we are called to minister to people who have destroyed their lives through all sorts of sexual immorality, through drug abuse, through all sorts of financial stupidity. Lord, these are people that need to be lifted up, cared for, loved, and encouraged to go in the way of righteousness. We ask that we would have the strength to do this ministry. We pray that you would raise up leaders in the state that would desire to rule wisely and humbly and do good for others rather than promote their own name and tribe. We pray for peace in a world of war, especially in the season when people throw around the word peace so loosely. We pray that they would understand what it means. Peace requires sacrifice, where we are willing to die to self and forgive others. Let peace begin with us as we have our treasure above and we learn to love our enemies. And now as we come before you, may we acknowledge that we have peace because the holy God now receives us as his adopted children through Christ. So we are able to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand now for the reading of the written word of the Lord. From the Old Testament, Psalm 96. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to Yahweh. Bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to Yahweh the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, The Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad. Let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar in all that fills it. Let the field exult in everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. From the New Testament, Luke 2, 1 through 20. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, fear not. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you, that you will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. 
When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen, as had been told them. So far the written word. We ask, O God, to hear your call to glorify your name for the peace that you have made through Christ the Son. We ask, O Lord, that we would understand the wonders of your gospel proclaimed, lived and fulfilled by Jesus Christ and how this day we are the beneficiaries of the crucifixion and the shed blood of the King of Kings, made for sinners. May we be thankful and praise your name always. Amen. Please be seated. This season is wonderful because it is the time that we are able to remember that God kept his word, that God fulfilled his promise, that sinners would be saved. And They would not be saved by the availability of holiness being provided to us as an extra vitamin, an extra boost for us to be able to keep the law, but rather a gift would be given to us, the perfect righteousness of the law given and fulfilled for us, credited to our account. But we need to understand why the people would have found this both a bit puzzling, but also at the same time, there would have been enough of the outlines and the shadows in the Old Testament for them to say, yes, this is true, we believe. There's a reason that many Israelites, many Jews believe the gospel because it was ordained, it was shown to them, and Christ perfectly fulfilled the prophecies. We've chosen Psalm 96 today because the words of Psalm 96 fit so clearly with the story, the words of the angels in verse 14 of Luke 2, that the glory of God would be proclaimed. Now let's consider Psalm 96 first shortly, and then we'll turn to Luke. The people of God were given the songbook of the Psalms in order that they would be able to worship God, but the Psalms are also composed and brought together theologically. And so we are told that this is the story of the righteous man who will obtain the benefits of God in the midst of a world of kingdoms rebelling against him, Psalms 1 and 2. And then with Psalm 1, we are told of the difficulties the kingdom suffers and yet the faithfulness of God. And in fact, that even if we are in the worst place possible, if you can see the sky or you can see a star, be assured that God is testifying to you. He is the creator, and he is abundantly able to provide for you. Even when you feel forsaken, understand that it is God himself who will be forsaken for your sake in order that he would die the sinner's death, and you can join the company of the elect who sing his praises forevermore. But it will be costly. It will be a long journey. And by the time you get to book three of the Psalms, the people have not listened to God. In fact, Psalm 95, immediately preceding Psalm 96, begins with telling people to rejoice in the Lord and to bow down and worship the Lord our God, for he is a great and faithful God. But Psalm 95 ends with these words of warning. Please don't follow the examples of those who came before you. Rather, listen to my word, because your forefathers by their words claimed that they would love and honor me, but their deeds were wicked. And so I hated them. I hate hypocrites. I hate people who claim to love me, but really only are going through motions trying to appease whatever karmic God is out there. They don't love me. And so I hated that generation. And then immediately afterwards comes Psalm comes Psalm 96, because now we are told, but here is how you are to think and act. Number one, sing to the Lord a new song. What does that mean? Well, in the Old Testament, there are two songs. There's the old song and there is the new song. The old song speaks of God the creator 
It looks upon all creation and says, this is the works of my Father. He has done all these things and made them very good and made this a world for me to dwell in. And because I see the testimony of his power, I am assured he will be able to give me all things. And so whether I am in a time of poverty and famine or in a time of overwhelming abundance, I can still trust him. He is my father. This time is ordained for me properly. So that's the first song, the old song. But the new song speaks of redemption. When you sing the new song, you are speaking of the work that God is to do after creation. And that is the work where he redeems sinners. So Psalm 96 then is to a people whose fathers in Psalm 95 didn't obey God and were hated, who now know that we have been saved. So we sing to God a new song, thanking him for loving and saving us. In fact, what we do when we sing this new song is we tell of his salvation from day to day. So you see the clarification. Declaring the glory of God to all the peoples of this world, to the Gentiles, to the nations. Speaking of the marvelous work that God does. And what is that marvelous work? God looking down on a world of idolatrous sinners and blasphemers sends his only begotten son to die the sinner's death and to redeem for himself a people from this group. To redeem for himself people from every tribe and tongue and nation and make them to be a kingdom, a holy nation, and priests to our God and Father. And so he is greatly to be praised. And we are to honor him more than we ever honored anything in this world. That's what it's speaking of here in verse 4, that he is to be feared above all gods. Now, the way we used to bow down and fear poverty, so we chased after money. The way we feared our reputation being harmed, so we attacked anybody who said anything about us. The way we feared someone would be better off than us, so we wanted to hear gossip about them and we spread gossip. How we devoted ourselves to these things. Vengeance, hatred, gossip, envy, lust. And now God says, I want you to fear me. I want you to love and honor me more than ever you ever put effort into any of these things. Put your effort into glorifying my name because you are understanding. You were an accursed sinner that I purchased with the blood of my son. That though you deserved nothing but punishment, I have instead made you an heir of everlasting life. So it's time for you to forsake all these other things that could never do anything for you and learn to love me. I am the creator. I am the one that the old song was sung to, acknowledging that I made heaven and earth. Now come and sing also the new song. I am the redeemer of sinners by the blood of my son. So you see there, ascribe to the Lord, credit to the Lord, and announce to the whole world, O families of the peoples, that God has all glory and all strength. So give the glory, do the name of the covenant God, Yahweh, the great I Am, and enter his courts. In Psalm 100, just four psalms from now, enter his courts with thanksgiving, knowing that God is our God and has made us. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. So you see, even though God was justly angry with our hypocritical and lying ancestors, he still extends grace to us and calls us to this great work to bring glory to his name and to be those who announce the glory of his name to the nations. So come and announce to the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, he is the one who made and established the earth. He will also be the judge, the ruler of the nations. And he will be a just ruler with equity, righteousness, and justice forevermore. So now you see the psalmist having contemplated, I get to live in the world of a creator who is also my redeemer. He realizes his voice is not enough. 
So now he wants heaven to praise God, the earth to praise God, the oceans to praise God, the animals in the oceans to praise God, every field to praise God, every animal in the field to praise God, and then the trees to praise God. Why? Because God is coming. And when he comes, it will be very good. Because he, the singer of the psalm, is one of the redeemed. So the presence of God makes everything right and good. And it is in that light then that Christ shows up and the angels announce to terrified shepherds, there is no reason for fear. Because when God comes, the holy God comes, he comes according to the promise he made as a redeemer. And that's why he has to come veiled. That's why he has to come as a baby. And in fact, he has to come even in that extra humiliated that he doesn't get to be born even in a palace, but rather in a manger, in a shepherd's stall, in a place of animals. Why? Because a sinful people have to recognize how, how much God had to humble himself to save us. Now, we've used many examples, so we'll refer to some of them. But imagine, like, if you are in a position of wealth, I mean, great wealth, you're a multi, multi millionaire, and you have friends who are not doing well. So you go to them, you're going to help them out. It's like, well, what do you have? It's like, well, I owe you know, 7,000 on my car, 200,000 on my house. These are numbers you laugh at. I mean, you know, you spend $200,000 buying a car because it's just fun. Do you like the color? Like, that's how rich you are. Well, at that point, when you pay off your friend's debt, is that really much of a sacrifice? Not at all. I mean, your friend knows you can do it, and he's thankful. He's very grateful you've done it. But in all of this, you lost none of your dignity. You lost none of your prestige and honor. In fact, you added to your honor by showing how easily you can just throw money around. But when God comes to save us, he doesn't come with glory and majesty because he has to take our place to die the sinner's death. And so he comes humiliated. And that's why it is remarkable these shepherds have, they have to wrestle. I mean, like, forget just you know, the stories that we tend to know of how the shepherds, you know, they, they left their sh sheep, they went to see Jesus, they rejoiced. It took a great act of faith on their part, even after the angels announced to them, to see that baby in a manger with the filthy animals and the smell of manure and to believe this is God in the flesh, the promised redeemer. Remember, these shepherds are descended from the same people at the end of Psalm 95. The people who saw the 10 plagues on Egypt, who saw the Passover, who saw the Red Sea opened, who then complained against God and said, we wish, we rather would have been slaves than here in the desert where we don't have flavorful food. These shepherds are of the same stock, but they took the warning of Psalm 95 and they heard the command of the angels and like Psalm 96, they said, it is time to glory in this, that God has made peace with men. He is pleased with us and is giving us peace. And so, as it says, when they're telling their story in Bethlehem, most of the people in Bethlehem didn't believe it. They didn't have respect for the shepherds. They didn't care for some stupid story about a baby in an animal shelter being the eternal God, our Redeemer. But Mary believed. The shepherds believed. And those who believed treasured up, pondered these things, and rejoiced. And now that gospel is being given to you. You are being told that God has made peace with you because he is pleased with you. He has loved you. But he didn't make peace the way most men think. It's not because you are the best. Remember the Apostle Paul tells the Corinthians, you weren't the richest, you weren't the most powerful, you weren't the smartest, you weren't the most beautiful, you were the ones loved by God. To the world we appear stupid, foolish, unwise, and yet we believe God 
keeps his word. That's the whole point, that we believe that God does fulfill every promise he has made, which is why we were able to sing Isaiah 40, knowing that we are sinners, we are able to believe God is now telling comfort. He wants you to hear all your sins have been paid for, that there is now the time for the gospel to go forth. And so it is time for the valleys to rise up, for the hills to be brought low, for the messengers to go forth and to declare a new song, a day of salvation of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Unfortunately to many in the world, this will still be a hidden and dark message and ignored. But to you who believe, you are able to see. Of course Jesus had to be born in a manger. Of course God had to die the sinner's death. Otherwise, how else could my debt be paid for? Of course, the only way for me to believe in a saving way would be through the preaching of the gospel. Because God is not overawing us with his presence as he will in the last day among his enemies but he's adopting us as children. What kind of a parent, when the baby is first born, you know, shock coming out of the womb and now with the air and lights and everything else, people don't start screaming at the baby. They wrap up the baby and hold him gently because it's gonna take a while for him to acclimate. Well, in the same way, when you are made aware that you are a sinner in the universe made by a holy God, it's mind-numbingly terrifying as the angels were filled with great fear. And what's God doing? Speaking gently. Speaking gently and saying, don't worry, I have good news for you. Is, there is for you today a Savior who was born, and you will go see that humble Savior. And once the angels are given by God to be able to understand and believe, then the heavenly host, then the armies of God come. Because at that point, they are no longer terrifying. Because it's no longer a holy God coming against me, the sinner. But it is the king's son seeing the king's army with their flags waving, showing up, knowing I am protected. And so we are able to hear these words of thunderous angels singing glory to God in the highest. And we're able to add our voices. We are able to turn to the Psalms and we are able to sing these words to God. And then we are able to sing of their fulfillment in Jesus Christ. And we declare to the world, God is coming to rule. You're in his world right now, you're ignoring him, but He's now giving you a moment of time to repent. He is calling you. So do you understand now the importance of your mission and mine? You and I are told to go to this hostile world and to tell them of a holy God extending mercy while it's still called today. We don't have time to worry about what somebody said or did to us. We have to forgive. We have to not keep a record. We have, we have something way more important to do. Do you think a soldier who's fighting is worried that there's mud on his uniform? I mean, think about it. They have bullet wounds that they bind up and they keep fighting. They're not worrying about trivial things. And that's why we were given the law today. Don't worry enough. God keeps a record. You have a great calling to sing the praises of God. Do you really want to waste your time gossiping? Do you, instead of announcing to the world that our Lord is going to reign in majesty and many will praise him, do you really want to spend your time bitterly sitting in the corner remembering every single grudge you've ever held? What a foolish thing to do. Instead, like the shepherds, they found a way. They didn't abandon their sheep, but they were able to say, okay, there's things to do. Obviously, we have to care. This is our income. This is, you know, probably maybe they're even uh, keeping these sheep for others. They have responsibilities. But it's still, there is time to go see God and praise him, this thing that was told to us. And when they returned, they were glorifying God and they were praising God because they had heard the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and seen him. So now to you also, 
The Lord Jesus has been announced. The word of God has been fulfilled. This is the day of glory because God is making peace with us by dying the sinner's death in your place. And now he is giving to you this great treasure which gives everlasting life. This is better than penicillin. This is better than any vaccine. This is life itself forevermore. And now it's in your hands. It is to be the fruit of your lips declaring to the whole world that you have heard and you've seen Jesus. Now, you didn't see Jesus with your own eyes the way these shepherds did. But when Jesus says, the church is my body, you've seen Jesus. People from every tribe and tongue and nation with different political interests, different economic interests, different national interests around the world, praising and believing in one Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So let the world see. We know we have peace with God. Because we have this peace with God, we are filled with joy. And because of this joy, we sing the new song of salvation, and we want the world to join us and praise the newborn King, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is now no longer the newborn, but the resurrected, ascended, reigning Savior who gives the world life from the dead. Let's pray. Our great God, may it be this day that we know, we are assured that there is peace. Peace because you have died the sinner's death and now you give to us your righteousness. Let us praise your name and not only locally, but to the whole world. And let the world see that we who have been forgiven much are a forgiving and gracious people. We who have been sinned against do not wish to remember any offense committed against us, but rather desire that Christ's character be worked in us, who loved us while we were his enemies. And so we pray, may your church, your body on earth, be indeed able to witness and evangelize and be the missionaries to the world and bring the light of the gospel to the nations that those who are in darkness will see the great light and will join in song and praise your name and declare your excellencies to the ends of the earth. We ask all this because Christ is worthy of all honor and praise. Amen. And so, beloved, with Psalm 98, we are able to now affirm that we believe the Lord comes to rule with justice and righteousness. So this is now based on Psalm 98, joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let us stand and sing. Please be seated. 
Well, like the shepherds, you are going to be told to look at something that seems so unglamorous and yet know that it is indeed God with us. They saw a weak, helpless baby in a manger. You see the bread and the wine as tokens of the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And just like them, you will be called to be nourished and invigorated with what the revelation of God is to you and then to go forth from this place declaring Christ has come and there shall be peace between God and men. And so, beloved, as we receive the Lord's Supper, understand it is God testifying to us of the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, the reality of his sacrifice as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, and the spiritual nourishment in order that you would continue to be transformed more and more, bearing the image and thinking the thoughts of the Lord Jesus Christ and able to declare his gospel to the nations. We read in the scriptures that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took the bread. And when given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. So do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of profaning the body and the blood of the Lord. Now, for all who live in rebellion and against God and in unbelief, this holy food and drink will bring you only further condemnation. If you do not yet confess Jesus Christ and seek to recognize him as your king and live under his gracious reign, we ask you to abstain from the table. Nevertheless, for those of you who know that you are sinners and have confessed your sins and have affirmed your faith in Christ as the only hope of sinners, the promise is sure and true for you. Whoever eats my body and drinks my blood has eternal life and will never come into condemnation. Understand that you're invited to the sacred meal not because you are worthy in yourself, but because you are clothed in Christ's perfect righteousness. So don't allow either the weakness of your faith or your sins, your failures in the Christian life to keep you from this table. This table is given to us because we are weak and because we are sinners in order that our faith would be increased by being fed with the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So as the word has promised us God's favor, so also our heavenly father has added this confirmation of his unchangeable promises. So come believing sinners, the table is ready. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Let's pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who by the blood of your only begotten Son has secured for us a new and living way into the Holy of Holies, cleanse our minds and hearts by your word and spirit, that we, your redeemed people, drawing close to you through these holy mysteries, may enjoy fellowship with the Holy Trinity through the body and blood of Christ our Savior. We know our ascended Savior does not live in temples made by hands. We affirm he is in heaven where he continues to intercede on our behalf. But through this mystery, by your own word and spirit, we know that these common elements are now set apart from ordinary use. And while remaining mere bread and wine, these sacred elements nevertheless become so united to the reality they signify that we do not doubt but joyfully believe that we receive in this meal nothing less than the crucified body and shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. So now we go to you, to our heavenly table, and receive the gift of God for our souls. Amen. Beloved, that we may be nourished with Christ the true bread from heaven, let us lift up our hearts to Christ Jesus, our advocate, who sits at the right hand of his heavenly Father, and let us firmly believe every one of his promises, not doubting that we shall indeed be nourished and refreshed with his body and blood through the working of the Holy Spirit, as surely as we receive the bread and wine in remembrance of him. So, beloved, lift up your spirits and hearts on high. We lift them up to the Lord. At this time, the elders will bring you forward to receive the elements, and we will partake together. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. But he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. 
for my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, even as the Father knows me, and I lay down my life for the sheep. The Father loves me because I lay down my life for the sheep and I have authority to take it up again. I do this of my own initiative. This is the commandment that I received from the Father. Jesus is before all things and in him all things hold together. He is head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself might come to have first place in everything. Indeed, it is the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness of deity to dwell in Jesus, and through Jesus to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him I say, whether things on earth or in heaven. I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he shall dwell among them. They shall be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God, and he will wipe away every tear from our eyes. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light, those who walk in a dark land, on them light will shine, and a child will be born to us, a son given, and the government will be on his shoulders. His name, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace, and there will be no end to the increase of his government or peace. We are called to remember the Lord Jesus Christ in two ways. One, as the eternal God, full of glory, and truth who now reigns on high, and the God who loved us so much he took on our flesh and died the sinner's death, humiliated by doing so in love for you. And so, beloved, we have sung the praises of our God. Now we must remember the sacrifice of Christ the Son. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and broke it and told his disciples, this is my body, my body broken for you because I love you. So, beloved, let us take, eat, remember, and believe Christ's body broken for us because of our sins that we should have everlasting life. Jesus also took the cup and declared, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, the promises of God fulfilled. So beloved, Take, drink, remember, and believe the blood of Christ that was sacrificed for you, that washes away your sins and makes you fit to dwell in the eternal presence of God forevermore. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we acknowledge the great mystery of this holy feast. Although we are unworthy to share this meal with you, it is by your invitation and dressed in Christ's righteousness that we have come boldly into the Holy of Holies. And instead of wrath, we've received your pardon. In the place of fear, we've been given hope. Our high priest and mediator of the new covenant has reconciled us to you and is even now interceding for us at your right hand. So please strengthen us by these gifts so that relying only on your promise to save sinners who call on your name, we may by your spirit, Honor you with our souls and bodies to the honor and glory of your holy name. Amen. Well, beloved, it is with the desire to honor God that we give our offerings. It is an expression of confidence that our inheritance is in heaven and thankfulness for all that we have received and a desire for the monies to be used for the propagation of the gospel to the whole world. And so, beloved, as you are exiting, if you are able, you know, the offering is available there. Let us conclude by standing and singing the Trinitarian doxology printed for us.
And it is the duty of the ministers of God to remind the people that indeed the Lord remains faithful to all his promises. As often as we sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And so we should never be discouraged, but always come before God, the gracious God who has given to us Christ the Son as the sacrifice for our sins. Yahweh the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace so that through all the trials and tribulations ordained for you, you will be assured you are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus who loves you. Be assured nothing will be able to separate you from the love of God. God's love for you is through Jesus Christ, his son. Amen. Go in peace.